Okay. Hello everybody. My name is Leslie Howard. I've lived in this part of the world for quite some time and I'm the author of Barrydale Unplugged. While I was doing my research, I gathered a lot of history about the area. But before we start on the history of the buildings, I'd like to give you a brief introduction because we must look at all history in context. As early as the mid-1700s, a few outlying lone place farms were settled in the vicinity of Barrydale, in the fertile valley that runs from west to east in the shadow of the mighty Longeberg Mountains. The valley is fed by water from the mountains, making it an ideal environment for farming. Long before the arrival of European settlers though, the Huehue and San had lived in the region for thousands of years, mainly on De Flocta, which is now San Borna, but also in cave shelters above the Trudeau River. Rock art abounds in the area, testimony to the self-sufficient lives lived by the little people, the little ones being the San, whom some people call the Bushmen, who were hunter-gatherers, and the taller people, the Huehue, who were pastoralists. Against this background, European settlers began to come into the valley, some of them escaping the control of the Dutch East India Company at the Cape. Two quitrent farms were granted to Adolphus von Koller and A. H. LaRue in 1832 in what is now Barrydale. In 1855, LaRue sold his farm to the sons of A.J. von Koller, and in 1878, the two brothers sold the western half of their land, which stretched as far as the Trudeau Pass, built by Thomas Bain and opened in 1873, for the establishment of a village, a church, and a school. Meanwhile, Robert Cook had bought Pietrus von Koller's farm, known as Trudeau's Hook, in 1892. These pioneers were the founding fathers of the village of Barrydale. The naming of Barrydale. There are differing opinions about the naming of Barrydale, but one thing is certain. The town was named after the famous Barry family, whose trading company, Barry and Nevews, had its headquarters on Fortrek Street in Swellendam. Legend has it, and this is a lovely local legend, that a daughter of the Von Koller family had fallen in love with a member of the Barry family who was responsible for surveying the plots for the new town and that she persuaded her father to name the town after him. The Barrys also owned a plot on Freer Street and later opened a store in the building now known as the Galleons. Before we talk about individual buildings, I'd just like to say a bit about the kind of architecture that you will see here in Barrydale in the old historic houses. It's mainly Clane Carew and Victorian architecture that we're talking about. But there are three types present in Barrydale in historic buildings. First of all, the vernacular Cape Cottage. The oldest cottages in Barrydale display this style of construction and feature whitewashed mud brick walls and thatched roofs, usually with an external chimney piece. End gables might be present. Then there are the Cape Victorian cottages, easy to spot. The features are corrugated iron roofs, either bull nose or cat slide veranda roofing, decorative brookie lace of fretwork or metal, sometimes stained glass windows and door panels, and stoop rooms in Afrikaans called stoop karmas, decorative end gables or gables over the front stoop room were also a feature. 
Usually these houses have outside staircases to the solder or loft. Then the third type of architecture, Karoo Georgian buildings. These include features such as flat roofs in Afrikaans known as brakdokke, flat fronts onto the street, decorated, decorative coining, which is also called rustication, which is a form of moulding, usually in white, around symmetrically placed windows, doors, and at the end of the front walls. Traditionally, these had no veranda. Now we get on to the actual historic buildings. Van Riebeck Street, let's begin there, because that is Barrydale's main shopping street, but it's also, more importantly, the heart of the historic area. First named Freer Street after Sir Bartel Freer, Governor of the Cape, Van Riebeck Street, which stretches in a straight line from the west to the east of the village, is the core of the heritage area. The street name was changed on the occasion of the tercentenary of the arrival of Van Riebeck at the Cape. Now, we're going to talk about one of our most important buildings, Morrison. This property on the corner of Van Riebeck Street and stretching down Sprig Street is the site of the first church built by the new community of Barrydale in 1877. The contractor was William Fullard, a member of a prominent local farming family, and Adam Plykees was the master builder. The carpenter was also a local man, Jakob Minnar. The building was constructed almost entirely from locally sourced materials, with high whitewashed gables front and back, three sash windows right and left, and a thatched roof. Poplar beams and yellow wood frames were part of the construction, and to this day the wooden pegs that served as nails are in evidence. The cornerstone was laid by Dermony C.F. Miller in 1877, but it was only in 1880 that the church came into use. The pulpit was donated by the wife of William Fullard. The posterity, which forms part of the property, is also of historic interest. It has a pillared veranda and the thatched roof has been replaced with corrugated iron. The coach house on the southern side of the property has been renovated to form a weekend cottage for guests. The history of the church is a colourful one. Five years after the opening of the church, the congregation apparently found it too small for their purposes, and as there was no lighting, services could not be held in the evenings. A decision was taken to build a new church in Van Riebeck Street, and for the Oakerk, as it became known, to become the mission church for the local coloured community. Finally, in 1939, the last service was held in the church before the new owner, G.P. Boerter, also known as Hippie, bought the entire property. In subsequent years, the lovely old building was treated with some disrespect. The sash windows were replaced by steel-framed windows, some of the yellow wood beams were removed and wire netting was strung from the rafters to hold fruit for drying. The church had been deconsecrated, but nevertheless, it seems a poor way to handle a church. In the early 2000s, Brendan and Stephanie Boerte bought the entire property from Fiona Knobel and having lovingly restored the church, the posterity, and the adjoining house known as Green Gables. Barrydale owes a huge debt of gratitude to the Boerters for their research into the architectural history of the buildings now known as Morrison, and for their painstaking and careful restoration. In the old days, the wagon route into Barrydale swept past 
the old gum tree still standing on the Morrison property and up into what was then Freer Street. This explains why the property was once known as Hort Achter Klip. The Hort Achter Klip being a large boulder placed in the roadway to guide the left rear wheel of a wagon that was required to make a sharp turn. Then we came to talk about the house Windy Ridge. On the corner of Sprig and Van Riebeck Streets on the northern side stands the building once known as Windy Ridge. It was at one time the townhouse of wealthy farmer Albert Fullard, and during the ostrich feather boom it was known as Barrydale's Feather Palace. The Dutch called these buildings Bobby Jan Heyser. Next to it is the Longhouse or De Longhuis, a fine old house in the traditional architectural style of what was known as Longhouses. It was registered in 1879. Coining around the sash windows and steps up to the two front doors are also typical features of old Cape houses in this era. The thatched roof has been replaced by corrugated iron. The interior features yellowwood floors and beams. At one time, the adjacent plot was used for the stabling of horses and the repair of wagons and carriages. The house is privately owned. The Galleons. Situated at 25 on Ribeck Street, this building also has an interesting history and is a typical example of a Brock Dock house, or a house built in the Karoo Georgian style with a flat front and a roof made of salty mud. It also features coining around the windows and doors and the ends of the front walls. The land on which the building is situated was sold by the Von Koller brothers to F. J. Geyer, plot 78, and plot 79 and 80 to Joseph J. Barry of the famous Barry Trading Empire in 1880. All three plots were later sold to A. C. Von Tonda and then on again to his son in 1917. The land and the building have changed ownership a number of times since then. Initially, the eastern side of the building served as a post office and the separate western side provided lodgings for boarders and also housed a Barry store. Although the central area was later enclosed providing the present day facade, the structure has retained its threefold division. Each section having a window and doorway at street level. There is a cellar under the building which once served as a cattle buyer and not to house slaves, as local legend would have it. The Galleons was built long after the abolition of slavery. The neighbour of the building, which is now divided into privately owned apartments, stemmed from the ownership of Commander William Sidney Lee of the Royal Navy who bought the entire property in his retirement years in the 1970s. Commander Lee was a prominent figure in the development of radar defences around the South African coast during World War II. According to the current title deeds, the main walls may not be demolished. It is worth noting that the original ceiling boards are still in place. The Karoo Art Hotel, which used to be known as the Barrydale Hotel, is standing on the corner of Lang and Von Riebeck Streets and it has long served its community and continues to do so. It was first established in the late 1800s by a Jewish merchant, one Abramovitz. A long history of new owners follows until the present day when the property is owned by Cape Town advocate Theo Nell. In 1937, the hotel was known as Bon Accord and later it became known as the Valley, Valley Inn. Subsequent owners were Tina Slobber, Elise and Freddie Strover and Philip Ace, a local artist. The annex on Lang Street was first used as a warehouse and wine cellar 
and in the 1950s it became the town cinema known as the Belanti. In recent years this use has been revived on Friday evenings where patrons enjoy watching a movie after a drink or a meal at the hotel. It was at the hotel in August 1901 that rebel commando leader Gideon Skippers held court after invading Barrydale from the east. He and his raggle-taggle band of saboteurs seized the hotel where they were fed, bathed and shaved. After raiding the store of William Sterner across the road and attired in new clothes, Skippers addressed the crowds in the street outside. There are photographs in the Cape archives which show Skippers talking to the people. The British town guard had fled down the pass and the rebel commando departed shortly afterwards to attempt a raid on Montague. Another interesting period in the hotel's history was when Albert Fullard granted shares to the property to his daughters Cecile and Honey. These two tough birds had recently returned from service in Egypt during the Second World War where they drove transport vehicles. They were notorious party girls and ran the place with a swing, despite the fact that Cecile was the church organist. Then, as always, the locals would enjoy a drink in the pub and catch up on the village gossip. The building has not changed much since its beginnings, although a photograph from 1901, as I says, said, shows Skipper standing at the front door of the hotel, but what's interesting, there was no veranda then, so that has been added later. Number 32, Fondrebeck Street. Next to the hotel, this house presents a handsome facade. It appears to be early 1900 in its design and retains some interesting features. Of particular interest are its pressed steel ceilings. When the Dutch Reformed Church down the road was under construction, pressed ceilings were ordered. There was an excess and some of it was used in this fine old home. Jacaranda Lodge, number 37, Fondrebeck Street, just diagonally across from where I'm sitting right now. Sadly, this building on the corner of Bain and Fondrebeck Streets has lost much of its original charm and no longer operates as a lodge. The building was erected by P.D. Smith, a local farmer and first mayor of the town. He opened a general dealer's store in the Stoop Palmer on the front veranda, which rapidly changed its name from P.D. Smith's general dealer to Pierre D. Smith Alchemiener Handelaar when Skippers and his party raided Barrydale. As a result of the raid, Smith's subsequent children were baptised Smith, whereas the first four children went by the name of Smith. While the shop operated in the Stupkama, on Poppy Smith ran a boarding house on the top floor. The stonemasons of Ledbury and Moon, who were building the new church across the road, were lodged there. Later, Smith also bought the house next door, now known as The Hub, with which its bull-nosed, corrugated iron roof and pillared front veranda was also typical of the building style of the late Victorian era in the colonies. At one time, there was a water trough for horses between these two buildings. The artist W. Kuravain bought the property in the 1980s and did extensive renovations. Two of his paintings depict the lodge as it used to be, one showing the gable that was added after the original construction and the original jacaranda tree, now still standing on the corner after all these years. Today the building is used for commercial purposes and its original gracious facade has lost its charm. Now we're going to talk about the new Dutch Reformed Church and Pastorie. 
In 1905, a decision was taken by the Dutch Reformed Congregation to build a new church. An enormous fundraising effort realised £5,000, which made the venture possible. The contractors were Ledbury and Moon, who were famous for their work on public buildings throughout the Overberg. With its handsome clock tower, stained glass and lancet windows, wooden ceiling and choir gallery, the church is a fine example of an early 20th century South African church architecture. It seats 600 people. The church clock and its chiming bells have been in operation since 1908, when the House of Worship was opened. The church is Barrydale's most famous landmark. A plaque near the front door of the church bears the following inscription, which I have translated into English. In time of hardship and trial, you are in the cloud that lies on the Longerberg and feeds the mountain streams. In prosperity, you are in the spring blossom of apricot and peach tree that in the summer bears red and yellow fruits. The postery next door was built in 1897 by J.P. Kennedy of Robertson, before the church itself. Photographs from the late 1800s show an elegant residence with pillared front veranda, covered by corrugated iron, and a gabled stupkama. The path to the front door was lined by cypress trees. The Trudeau Guest House, 46 von Rebeck Street. The building appears to be of late 1800s provenance and was owned for many years by the Fontonda family. In the late 1930s, it was used as a boarding establishment for high school students whose homes were on the farms. Later, it became yet another Barrydale General dealer store, and in the 1970s, yet another guest house. Its unusual end gables, stained glass windows and front veranda opening onto a tiny street garden make it a building of great charm. It is still run as a guest house and has a lovely courtyard garden behind the building. And then right next door, 48 von Rebeck Street. The house was built in similar style to the Drow Guest House in the late 1800s. The front door and stained glass windows facing the veranda are still the originals. It is believed that at some stage the house was also used as a boarding hostel for scholars. The White House, Corner Tinley and Van Riebeck Streets. This handsome building, now run as a B&B, and next door to the hospice cottages is another example of the Karoo Georgian or Brock Dock style with its coining around the sash windows and its flat roof. The veranda has been added when renovations were undertaken. This little cottage that I'm about to talk about is perhaps one of the most charming and the most interesting in Barrydale. 55A Von Koller Street, the Von Koller Cottage. This charming thatched and whitewashed cottage was given by P.J. Von Koller to his son Jacobus as a wedding gift in 1892. It is one of the oldest houses in Barrydale and is still owned by descendants of the Von Koller family and was built of mud brick when renovations were done on the house in the 1950s, spent cartridges from the clash with Gideon Skippers' as commando were found lodged in the chimney. The barn next door, which forms part of the property, is an architectural treasure. It is built entirely of mud and stone, has a cobbled floor and its original poplar beams and, beams and reed ceilings. In the stable alongside, a wooden manger runs the full length of the structure. There is also a hayloft, which has now been transformed into extra accommodation. In the old days, the property's vineyards ran right up to the river, and the underground vats that were built to store wine and brandy are still there. 
the stone wall and quince hedge across the road. A wall made of stone and mud was built in 1877 to demarcate the division between the Von Kullers farm and the rest of the village. A quince hedge was planted alongside the wall. It was behind this wall that Skippers and his commander took cover on the 21st of August 1901 when the British town guard fired on them from the redoubt at the top of the hill above the school. The remains of the wall still stand today, but they are crumbling fast with constant exposure to the weather. A plaque has been erected on the site to commemorate the building of the wall and the founding of the town. Amazingly, the old quince hedge still bears fruit. Now I'd like to talk about some interesting relics higher up on the farmland. The ruined structures on the old Muros Rafir farm. On the ground that once belonged to A.H. Leroux, now municipal land, near the start of our hiking trail, there are the walls of an old kraal and the remains of an old farm building. These date back to the mid-1800s when they belong to Leroux. A larger farmhouse stands on the property now and is owned by the municipality. But this was built quite recently, I would say probably in the 1950s. Some 400 metres to the east, hidden by wattle trees and other growth, are the ruins of a water mill. This was used to grind the flour for the bread that supplied Thomas Baines' force of convicts when they were building the Trudeau Pass. Tennant Street. Before the existence of Route 62, a gravel track that ran parallel to von Riebeck Street, but to the north, extended from the western edge of town to the steep hill above the present day school. This led onto the rough road to Ladysmith. Photographs in the archives show small cottages on the south side of the road, which later became Tennant Street. Most of these cottages had end gables, thatched roofs, and outside stairs that led to the loft or solder. These were used for the storage of grain, fodder, dried fruit, and a coffin. In the absence of funeral parlours in the old days, families had to be prepared for the possibility of sudden death. The first school. On the corner of School and Tennant Streets, you will find the remains of the first school, which was opened in 1885. The first teacher was one for Scheer, hailed, and he hailed from Villiersdorp. He was followed in 1890 by Miss A.M. Stain, who later married Albert Fullard and whose cousin became the president of the Free State. The Fullards later retired to Windy Ridge on Van Riebeck Street. The first school principal was P.H. Tiernison, who served from 1900 to 1918. The first small school had a thatched roof and steps leading from two sides to the front door. It was bought by the municipality in 1937 and transformed into its offices and the first library. Today it serves as the premises of the fire brigade. The present day high school at the end of Tennant Street and opposite the Cook Farm was built on ground donated by Robert Cook in 1918. The rugby field was later donated by his son. Across the road from the first school, also on the corner of School Street, is what was once a charming whitewashed thatched cottage with a lovingly tended rose garden in front. It is described by the Swellendam Heritage Association as a vernacular Victorian cottage and appears in the earliest photographs of streetscapes in the town. Sadly, after a fire burned part of the roof, it now stands unoccupied and awaits a new owner to do much needed repairs. 
On the corner of Tinley and Tennant Street, a small cottage stands on this site, just below Route 62. It is quite charming, has a thatched roof, whitewashed walls, and a small stoop with concrete benches at each end. That, of course, was quite a traditional feature. It, too, is in a state of poor repair, and in the absence of an owner who can afford the necessary maintenance, it is at risk of falling into a state of total neglect. Back to School Street. Here we find Valley Forge, with its high-pitched roof and traditional veranda, and it was once home to one of the Barrydale blacksmiths. It is a handsome example of a typical Victorian house, and originally the roof was thatched. The building that housed the forge still exists. The wife of the blacksmith provided villagers with fresh eggs and milk from the cows that grazed across the road on the ground that is now the Bowling Green and Recreation Club. Bain Street, All Saints Anglican Church. The present All Saints Church was inaugurated in 1935. It is built on the site of an older church and is a pretty little building with a freestanding bell arch. The church has wonderful acoustics and is cared for by a small group of faithful congregants. A Bible garden was created in recent years, featuring cypress trees, olive and rosemary bushes. Peter Narishkin laid out the garden, which is in need of care and restoration, as is the building itself. Sadly, the required funds are lacking. Hill Street. To the north of Route 62 and parallel to it is a gravel road known as Hill Street. There are a number of simple but pretty thatched cottages along the street that were once owned by some of the coloured folk of the town. On the north side of the street is a plastered and stone cottage. On the same earth stands a stone building that was used as the powder house by Thomas Bain. Helia Street now, and first its cottages. Almost on the corner are three semi-detached thatched cottages. It seems that they date from the light, late 19th century. They make a pretty picture against the backdrop of the grassy Karoo slopes, and once were home to coloured folk who were forced to abandon them when the apartheid removals took place. Today they belong to one owner and although the facades remain unaltered, significant renovation has changed their character. The Interdenominational Church. This quaint structure stands right at the western end of Hillier Street against the Kopi. Although it was built almost in the late 1900s, it retains the character of a Victorian church building with a corner stained glass window and a thatched roof. It is a whitewashed building that fits neatly into the vernacular architecture of the village. Route 62, or Ladysmith Road. Where the present Diesel and Cream restaurant stands, there used to be an outspan place for wagons. An old Dutch oven still exists in the ground. There remain two Karoo Georgian houses with flat, flat fronts and roofs along the route between the shopping areas. Both are in need of restoration. At the mud property, now owned by the Barrydale Weavers and just past the Dutch Reformed Cemetery, a mud house, outhouse fronts onto Route 62. This was the Barrydale 